Welcome to Gungahlin Anglican Church. It's great to have you with us. The topic for our service today is Don't Judge. We'll hear from Matthew 7 and Psalm 143. Tim Hall, our, one of our ministers, will be speaking to us from those passages. And kids, you can look forward to the talk that Sarah is going to bring you later on. We get to sing and praise our great God. First, let me pray. And Lord, we do thank you so much that we can join together by these means and listen to your word and pray and sing and glorify you. We pray that you would help us to concentrate and enjoy it. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing praise to our God now. The Nicene Creed is one of the most famous and influential creeds in the history of the church because it settled the question of how Christians can worship one God and also claim that this God is three persons. It was also the first creed to obtain universal authority in the church 
and it improved the language of the Apostles' Creed by including more specific statements about the divinity of Christ and the Holy Spirit. Let's say together the summary of what Christians believe in the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God. Begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he was incarnate of the Virgin Mary, and he became man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe one holy and Catholic, one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Now, Jesus said to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. How much of you or I loved God, the one who created us, this week? If we're honest, it wasn't much of the time. Let's take a moment now to think about what we've done against God and others this week before we confess our sins together to him. Together, Heavenly Father, you have loved us with an everlasting love, but we have broken your holy laws and have left undone what we ought to have done. We are sorry for our sins and turn away from them. For the sake of your Son who died for us, forgive us, cleanse us and change us. By your Holy Spirit, enable us to live for you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And in Colossians the Bible says, God delivered us from the power of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of the Son he, lo he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Beep, beep. <laughs> no, 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 no. Is today the day? <laughs> yes, Scruff, today is the day. Woohoo! Everyone's going to see my brilliance. Indeed. Hi everyone, welcome back to QuizWorks Home Delivery. I'm Matt, and I'm the soon-to-be superstar actor, Scruff. Today, we're continuing our series looking at Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. And who are the people that Jesus is teaching? Look with me, these are people who are chosen by Jesus, called by Jesus, and loved by Jesus too. Now we're to follow Jesus, live like Jesus, and become like Jesus too. In other words, Jesus' people are going to live differently to the people who don't follow Jesus. Come on, is it time for the video yet? N nearly scuffed. Today, we're looking at Jesus' teaching in Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 to 5, where, where Jesus talks about not condemning, or other translations say judging, so that's what we're going to use, not judging others. This is what Jesus says. Do not judge others, and God won't judge you. God will be as hard on you as you are on others. He will treat you exactly as you treat them. You can see the speck in your friend's eye, but you don't notice the log in your own eye. How can you say, my friend, let me take the speck out of your eye, when you don't see the log in your own eye? You're nothing but show-offs. First, take the log out of your own eye. Then you will see how to take the speck out of your friend's eye. Remember, Jesus uses lots of picture language here in the Sermon on the Mount. And so we're going to imagine what this is like now. Woohoo! It's time to watch! The puppets are real. The cases are crazy. The judge is a dog. Welcome to the courtroom of Judge Scruff. 
A core room? But I didn't do anything. Ooh, ah! mm. <gasps> <gasps> oh, you're going down, boy. Oh. All rise for the Honorable Judge Scruff. Scruff Dog's in the house. He's got a... He's... My court. Ah, uh, yeah, I got an order. Ah, uh, chocolate bone pizza. Hmm. Right. Now I've looked at all the evidence, and I can see that you, Mendel, are in big trouble. Me? No question in my mind about it's it. Scruff. Uh -huh. That's your honour to you. Oh, Scruff, your honour. Uh -huh. I don't need to hear any more about it. I can see quite clearly that there is a speck of sawdust in your eye. But you? Uh -huh. It could get infected. It could turn all gooey and crusty, and then get so bad that it falls out and rolls across the floor and gets stomped on, and then there'll be big eye blobs all over my courtroom! Uh, uh, oh, Gus, you okay? <sighs> oh, yeah, I'm okay. Right, why don't you tell the court how you got the speck in your eye in the first place? Well, I was in a chicken coop trying to catch a chicken to make my favorite dinner roast chicken wrapped in seaweed. When I kick some sawdust up, right into my eye. Don't you know that whenever you go chicken chasing, you should wear safety goggles, you silly little thing? Ugh. Ah, but um... Uh, no buts about it. I am the judge. And I say, you are guilty! Guilty? Guilty of what? Of being a silly pink guy who doesn't know they should wear safety goggles. But how can you- I can do it because I am the judge. Okay, we've got to get that speck out of your eye right now. Your honor. Ah, it's okay. I will get it. <gasps> He's coming. Right, oh. now, where did it go? Oh. Can I have a hand, please? Oh, there you go. What's this? Oh, not that kind of hand. <laughs> Something to get it out with. Yeah. Ah, yeah, this will work. A sword? Scott, you can't use a sword. Look at your own um, eye, man. Do it. Do it. Uh, no, no good. Um, something else, please. Come on. A rubber chicken? Scrap, you can't uh, use a yes. rubber chicken. Rubber Look chicken. at your own eye. No, something else. I need something to get it out with. Ah. Uh. Yeah. Tongs? This will work. You can't use tongs. Okay, That's now, just stay still. Look Don't worry, I'm a professional. Do yes. it. Do it. What do you mean? Do it. Right. 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 Just stay still. Right! Order! Order in my court! What are you all making so much noise about? Psst. There's a blank in your eye. What, what do you mean I got a blank in my eye? What? Where? Right there. Huh? Ha! Huh. That little thing? Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's in it's your right. eye. I'll work around it. No. Oh, stay oh, 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 no worry, I'll get it. I'm a professional. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Don't worry, folks. I got it. Yeah. Yes, I was brilliant. Oh dear, but did you understand what you were illustrating, Scrap? Of course I did. Jesus wants people to be like me and not to be like Mendel. Actually, Scrap, he was teaching the exact opposite of that. He, he was? Yeah. Jesus was saying that his people aren't to act like they're better than others. Instead, uh, we're to look at ourselves and see the areas that we're failing in. And when we find that we're failing and doing the wrong thing, well, we're to ask God to forgive us and, and to change us. We're not to try to make ourselves look better than other people. Oh, so I got that quite wrong. You did, Scruff. Oh. And I still did a pretty good job of acting, didn't I? You did. Cool, maybe I'll go and watch it again, now that I know what it means. See ya! <laughs> See ya, Scruff. For the past few weeks, we've been thinking about living differently as one of Jesus' people. And to help you with that, 
And don't forget you can register at www.quizworks.com slash home delivery so you can get some activity sheets and game and craft ideas and some discussion questions that can help you keep thinking about what it means to follow Jesus, live like Jesus, and become like Jesus too. See you next week. We're going to have the Bible readings now. Let's pray first. Thank you, God, so much for your word to us in the Bible. Thank you that we can trust it. And thank you that it's sufficient for understanding how to know you and how to be saved by you. Help us by your spirit now to hear it and understand it today. Amen. Hi, I'm Ray Lee. I usually attend the 7 p.m. service. And this is our first reading, Psalm 143. Lord, hear my prayer. Listen to my cry for mercy. In your faithfulness and righteousness, come to my relief. Do not bring your servant into judgment, for no one living is righteous before you. The enemy pursues me. He crushes me to the ground. He makes me dwell in the darkness like those long dead. So my spirit grows faint within me. My heart within me is dismayed. I remember the days of long ago. I meditate on all your works and consider what your hands have done. I spread out my hands to you. I thirst for you like a parched land. Answer me quickly, Lord. My spirit fails. Do not hide your face from me, or I will be like those who go down to the pit. Let the morning bring me word of your unfailing love, for I have put my trust in you. Show me the way I should go, for to you I entrust my life. Rescue me from my enemies, Lord, for I hide myself in you. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. May your good spirit lead me on level ground. For your name's sake, Lord, preserve my life. In your righteousness, bring me out of trouble. In your unfailing love, silence my enemies. Destroy all my foes, for I am your servant. This is the word of the Lord. Hello, I'm Joel, and I attend the 9.30am service. Today's Bible reading comes from Matthew chapter 7, from verse 1. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye, and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye. How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. I wonder, did you ever play those sort of uh, shooting or maybe sword-based uh, games when you were a kid where you were obliged to pretend that you were injured or, or dead? Uh, that is until there was always one kid who came up with some sort of impenetrable force field. So no matter what you did, they come up well with, oh, well, that didn't work because I've got my super force field on and it blocks whatever you're doing. My shield has, you know, anti-super deflective bomb reflectors or whatever it might be. That's how some people treat today's Bible verse that we're looking at, Matthew 7.1. No matter what you might come at them with, their response is, and it's usually in King James English, judge not lest ye be judged. It's the ultimate trump card for securing a victory in any argument. And here's how it usually works. They quote Jesus, judge not lest ye be judged. Act like anyone who disagrees with you is then foolish or intolerant and then make a clean getaway with Jesus at the wheel. It's like the mic drop of all mic drops. I think these days, Matthew 7, 1 is actually the best known Bible verse outside particularly of Christianity, outside of people in church. 
There was a time, of course, when John 3.16 was the best known Bible verse. People would turn up to sporting events and festivals with signs that said John 3.16 or John 3.16 painted on their faces. But now it's all about Matthew 7.1. Don't judge or you will be judged. But is that what this verse is all about? See, of course, it's all about context, isn't it? We're doing a short three-week series at the moment uh, showing that you can preach on just one verse. But what it really does is it shows you how bad it is to just take one verse out of context. One famous apologist says, never read a Bible verse. And he doesn't mean don't read the Bible. What he means is that you should at least read a paragraph. You should at least read the context surrounding what you're trying to say. Because if you rip a verse like this out of its context, and if you take it by itself, then sure, it says exactly what we were saying at the start there. You know, don't judge me. You can take it as a free pass to do whatever you want. But clearly, Jesus Jesus isn't saying that we shouldn't judge under any circumstances. I mean, just down in verse 6, in the same paragraph, Jesus says, don't give to dogs what's sacred. Don't throw pearls to pigs. If you do, they might trample them under their feet and tear you to pieces. That obviously requires some sort of judgment. And later in verse 15, he tells his disciples to watch out for false prophets, for they come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're ferocious wolves. Clearly, that requires some kind of discernment, some kind of judgment. And there are other passages in the scriptures that tell us to use judgment as well. In 1 Corinthians, the church is told to expel an immoral brother. They're told to hand him over to Satan. Now that sounds pretty extreme, and it certainly sounds like judgment to me. In Galatians chapter 1, Paul calls down God's curses on anyone who preaches a different version of the gospel to what Paul himself preaches. In Philippians chapter 3, Paul again uses strong language to warn his readers against false teachers. He says, watch out for those dogs, those men who do evil, those mutilators of the flesh. And John likewise demands some sort of judgment when he writes, and we just learned about this in 1 John chapter 4, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they're from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And when a crowd misjudges Jesus because his healing ministry extends to the Sabbath, he doesn't forbid all judgment, but he says, and this is in John chapter 7, stop judging by mere appearances and make a right judgment. See, to judge, of course, can mean a few different things. It could be like a judge, as we think of it, making a legal verdict, declaring someone innocent or guilty. Or it could be then simply using discernment about something. And quite often when the Bible uses this word judge, that's how it's interpreted. That's how it's translated. Uh, You know, should I cross the road right now? Well, that actually requires discernment. You're making a judgment. Should I make a financial deal with this person I haven't met? Should I marry this person? All these things require discernment or judgment. See, and I don't think though then that it's either, uh, I don't think that it's either of those kinds of things that Jesus is talking about here. Rather, it's a judgmental spirit that Jesus condemns. See, the third way of translating this word judge from the original language is to condemn. It's an attitude that says, I'm better than you. And of course, this is exactly where the context helps us. The context of this passage, of course, is the Sermon on the Mount. See, there were some people in the old system that thought they were better than others. They hadn't murdered anyone. They hadn't committed adultery. They were pretty good at keeping the the Jewish law. But Jesus puts these people in their place. He takes murder to the hating level. He takes adultery to the heart level. So that it might be then with the new system, when Jesus says things like, love your enemies, love your neighbors as you love yourself, that we create an opportunity to say to ourselves, well, I'm doing pretty good at that. At least I'm I'm doing better than he is anyway. And I never pray like that that self-seeking hypocrite. I never let my left hand know what my right hand's doing when I'm giving to the needy. And when I fast, man, I look like an Instagram influencer on holidays. 
See, this context tells me that when Jesus says here not to judge others, he's saying that we shouldn't have a critical spirit about others. And we shouldn't have an elevated view of ourselves and our own ability to do what's right and good. And if you don't believe me, you just have to look at the rest of this paragraph, the immediate context. So he goes on, we've got verse 1, Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way as you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So it's easy to see how powerful and dangerous the temptation to be judgmental can be. A follower of Jesus takes the challenge to be holy seriously. We put in discipline, we put in service, we put in obedience. And then, though, we can tell ourselves, well, I can afford to look down my nose at my less disciplined brothers and sisters. Or maybe I've actually understood that I've had a good measure of God's grace, but somehow I've come to think that I've earned that. So as a result, I might look down on those who, in my view, their vision of God and vision of God's grace isn't as large as as mine, whose faith isn't as stable, whose grasp of the deep truths of God isn't as masterful, whose service record isn't as impressive, or at least in my eyes, in people's eyes, whose efforts aren't as substantial. See, these people, we, we diminish them in our own eyes and we consider their value inferior to our own value. That's one way that this could work where we're judging. But of course, it could work the opposite way too. Instead of elevating ourselves, it could be that we have a thing for seeing the worst in others. You know, that kind of attitude that says, I'll shoot first and ask questions later. Is there a piece of biblical wisdom that's more routinely ignored in conversation than Proverbs 18.17? It says, the one who states his case first seems right until the other comes and examines him. Or as the famous prophet Phil Collins said, we always need to hear both sides of the story. Unfortunately, it happens all the time. Pastors sinfully judge parishioners based on hearsay. Church members criticize pastors without knowing the whole story. Citizens assume the worst about politicians when another scandal gate of what or whatever it is emerges. Kids attack their siblings at the worst first whiff of error. See, most of us go through life hearing dozens of reports and accusations about celebrities and athletes and pastors and people we know under, operating under the unwritten rule that where there's smoke, there must be fire. And sometimes it's true. But sometimes it's not. American pastor Kevin DeYoung says this. He says, As Christians, we realize that sin deserves rebuke and the sinned against should have our deepest compassion. But we should also remember from the last days of our Lord that believing every accusation can be just as bad as making them. As long as there is Jesus, we have to allow that controversial and accused don't always mean troublemaker and guilty. We should use the same measure with others that we would want used with us, which means an open heart and an open mind. Do you want people assuming the worst about you? Do you want people passing along every bad report they hear about you? What if people talked about us the way we talked about others? See, both of these are opposite sides of the same coin. And both of them are about the plank removal that Jesus is talking about here. So I want to finish with uh, four principles. And this isn't exhaustive by any means that stand out when trying to grasp what Jesus is and what what he is and what he's not saying here. So the first is we've got to be careful about using a single Bible verse to make a point. Hopefully I've, I've made this point pretty well here, so I'm not going to prolong on it. But, you know, as I said at the start, we don't read a Bible verse. We need to understand the context to understand what it means. 
I don't know anyone who likes to get their words twisted, so let's do our best not to twist Jesus and not to twist the scriptures. Secondly, we need to make judgments with empathy and grace. In other words, we don't approach judgment of others without an intimate knowledge of our own sin before a holy God, of our own need for grace and forgiveness. See, that'll keep us in check as we approach others. That will keep our own plank in vision. Thirdly, never judge with hypocrisy. That's not to say we have to be perfect in a particular area to call someone out on that area. But what we need to do is to avoid viewing ourselves as better than others who sin. Romans 2 talks about this. Romans 2 says, You then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who bore idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? As it's written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Now, I'm sure we can all name unfortunate examples where God's name is blasphemed, as Paul says here, because of people who essentially say, do as I say and not as I do. And your mind might go to more famous examples. But, you know, me, when I'm hearing that, I'm looking to myself. I'm looking at my own heart. What in me has caused God's name to be blasphemed in the world? So that's the third thing. Fourthly, don't cower in fear when a judgment actually needs to be made. See, we shouldn't use Jesus' warning against hypocrisy as an excuse to absolve ourselves from declaring an unpopular truth. In the end, Jesus is the advocate we need. Jesus is the advocate we long for. He's the one who justifies those who trust in him. He doesn't turn a blind eye to sin, but he sees it and he takes the judgment we deserve so that we can stand justified, so that we can live under his wise rule. I want to finish with Tim Keller's summary of all this because I just think it's so good. And you might have seen this going around social media this week. It's so good. I had to share it here, though. Tim Keller said, I've been asked why it's especially wrong for Christians to speak of their opponents in a demonizing and dehumanizing way. First, he says, historic Christians believe that our sin has made us worthy of condemnation and hell. From those living respectable lives to those leading criminal lives, All of us fall infinitely and therefore equally short of loving and serving God in the way that is due him. Therefore, we can only be saved through Christ by sheer grace. The Westminster Confession of Faith, he says, says, As there is no sin small, but it deserves damnation, so there is no sin so great that it can bring down damnation upon those who truly repent. So then, he says, Christians can never feel morally superior to anyone at all. And that means, and he says this is the main point, when we get call out evil doing and others, as vital that as that is, we can never imply by our attitude or language that they deserve condoms that they deserve God's condemnation, but we don't. Therefore, he says, the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. Right now, he finishes, our very social fabric is tearing apart because of, among other things, increasing mutual demonizations on both sides. Christians must not contribute to this in any way. Brothers and sisters of Gungahlin Anglican Church, I understand that as this pandemic drags on, we are getting weary. It is easy for us to slip into this trap of viewing others as more worthy of condemnation than ourselves, of seeing the faults in others and forgetting to look at our own. Let's not do that, but let's pursue flourishing together in Jesus' name. May he empower us to judge with clarity, humility, courage, and with beam-free eyes. Amen. I am alive, saved by your sight. i
dispels the night. You call the lifeless to wake from death to life. Out of darkness arise. I am set free, saved from the power of sin. a time of prayer. Hello, 
I'm Charles Hocart from the 9.30am service. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you to thank you for our many blessings. We thank you for the new growth and flowers of spring that remind us of your munificence in providing for our physical needs, food, shelter and clothing. We thank you for your word, fulfilling our spiritual needs the promise of sin forgiven and the offer of eternal life for those that believe in you. For these gifts we offer our praise and worship. We pray for healing. Many people are struggling in a world suffering the ravages of war, poverty, sickness and family separation. We pray for healing and the patience to endure the challenges of social isolation. We pray for our leaders. Lord, we pray for the leaders of our church, Red and Tim, along with the leaders of our territory, state and federal governments. May they be instruments of your peace. We pray for wisdom in their deliberations. Help them to listen, to empathise and to arrive at solutions for the benefit of all people. We pray for peace. Lord, you are our refuge and strength in troubled times. We pray that the worldwide storms of war, rage and violence may abate and turn into the glorious spring of a new beginning. We pray that the world's refugees may be treated humanely and find safe refuge. Help us all to work together to reconcile the differences that drive us apart. Finally, we pray for a spirit of unity, love and peace to inspire our thoughts, actions and words. We pray that you will bring those that don't let know you into your fold and that we who do know you may draw closer to you. May we, your supplicant, serve as an example to others, reflecting your life and teachings into our community. We ask all this in the name of our Saviour, your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please join me now in reciting the words our Lord taught us to say. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. A few announcements now. Our church has a great range of growth groups you can join to get to know both God and other people better. There are 17 groups to choose from, running at different times, with people from the three individual services and some that have people from multiple services. Details are available from the church newsletter or by contacting the church office. And you can do that by sending an email to office at gungarlananglican.org.au. Just contact the person running the group to see if it'll suit you. Growth groups are a great way to grow your faith and fellowship. Some other good news, we'll be returning to face-to-face -to -face services from the 18th of October. Online services will continue for that week and the week after as well, but following that we'll have more, a more basic service online so that those who can't attend in person can still take part. From the 18th of October, the 9.30am service will be outside behind Grace Chapel. The 10am service will be outside in the quadrangle at the Ford campus and the 7pm service will meet in the Salvation Army Church uh, on the Valley Avenue in Gungahlin. Further information will be emailed out shortly. We hope that you have enjoyed this online service. May you have a great week. Hear these words from Matthew 7. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when there is a log in your own eye, you hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. 
And finally from Jude, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Saviour, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen.